All right, thank you for joining this special meeting of the Board of Trustees to discuss the draft annual discipline report. Uh, Dag, would you take the roll, please? Broughton. Here. Chen. Here. Cisneros. Here. De La Cruz. Delen. Here. Duran. Here. Ganon. Here. Petula. Shelby. Sowell. Stallings. Here. Tony. Present. Sleg. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin with a call for public comment. If you would like to provide public comment to the Board of Trustees regarding the matter on our agenda today, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. And uh, Dag, we have one person who's called in. Could you um, uh, tell them how to bring themselves to your attention if they're calling in on a phone. I, I will do that. I'm going to um, allow uh, Mr. Coleman, Thomas Coleman, who has a hand raised to speak. I'll give Mr. Coleman three minutes, um, which is the allotted time. As I look up which key it is you depress, I believe it's star nine, but I want to double check that. And then uh, when Mr. Coleman is concluded, I can uh, give that information. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coleman, your mic is available and you have three minutes to okay. provide public comment. Thank you very much. My name is Thomas F. Coleman. I'm the legal director of Spectrum Institute. And I just wanted to make a few follow-up comments to a report that we sent to the Board of Trustees a few days ago and to the Supreme Court and to an op-ed article that was published in the Daily Journal newspaper on the same topic. And basically the topic is that the current complaint and discipline system is not accessible to people with cognitive disabilities, especially in the uh, probate conservatorship proceeding. Uh, the current system is based on an assumption that does not apply to this class of people. The assumption being that they are able to file complaints, that they're able to know that they're being shortchanged or that there's some violation of ethics or professional standards and that they have the ability to file a complaint and they do not. So in order to make the benefits of the system available to them, uh, we're suggesting that there should be some type of a workaround, some modification, some accommodation that is done. Uh, and especially this would make the preventive benefits of the system available to them. That is attorneys, when they know that someone might file a complaint, there might be an investigation, there might be discipline, uh, it has an effect on their future behavior, all attorneys. And when they also, the converse is true, when they believe that there will never be a complaint, that affects their conduct as well in an adverse way. So we're suggesting two suggestions we made. One is that the state bar develop performance standards for court appointed counsel in these cases. So they know what's expected of them and uh, uh, and then secondly, that there's a certain uh, percentage of random audits that's, that would be done statewide. So they would know that uh, there's a possibility, as remote as it might be, uh, that they could be uh, subject to an investigation and discipline. So otherwise, I think the rest is uh, stated fully in the report. And we'd be happy to work with the state bar on developing any of this to make its system uh, uh, accessible to this class of people. All right, thank you, Mr. Coleman. And I don't see any of their hands and the phone caller has actually dropped off. So I think we can proceed to our uh, item of business, which is item 701, approval of the annual discipline report for 2020. Melanie and Lisa, take it away. Hi, good afternoon, trustees. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen to get us started. Present from the beginning. Hey, everyone see my screen up there? Okay, terrific. Um, so uh, my name is Lisa Chavez. I'm the director of ARIA. And today, Melanie Lawrence, interim chief trial counsel, and I will present a summary of the 2020 annual discipline report. This is a report on the performance of the discipline system that is due by statute every April 30th. 
uh, and we send this report to the Chief Justice of California, Assembly and Senate leadership and their Judiciary Committees. Uh, we're going to take this in a couple of steps. Uh, first, I'm going to be giving an overview of the report, its structure and its contents for the purpose of orienting you to this 100 plus page document and also engaging in a little, little bit of level setting for our new trustees. And then next, Melanie and I will both share highlights of the report, that is uh, specific findings that we'd like to elevate for you. And Melanie in particular will take you into an in-depth discussion of the backlog in the case prioritization system. But before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work and commitment of all staff across the organization that contributed to the success of this project and to state our leadership for their excellent feedback and guidance. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge OCTC whose hard work is the main subject of this accountability report. Uh, their partnership in my office's effort to illuminate their important work that they do beyond a series of data tables, um, as always, is invaluable. And for my office in particular, Araya, um, I'd like to tease them and say, you know, we do a lot of regular reporting, but this report is kind of like our Super Bowl. I say that as a baseball fan, it's like our Super Bowl. Um, and I'm really proud of the attention to detail that my staff give to this work and their willingness to really leave no stone left unturned as we engage in this important research. And with that, I'll get started. Okay. So then I'll just do a report. It really has three components, this 100 plus page document. Uh, the first uh, 22 pages is like a narrative. And in that narrative, we discuss um, operations, initiative, and successes of the state bar discipline system for the 2020 um, year. The next part of the report are the statutorily mandatory mandated tables. And these are a set of data tables that respond to uh, specific requirements outlined in these three uh, different sections of, of legislative code. And I'll get into those in a moment. And then the last part of the report are a set of appendices. And this is really meant to give you background information on all the contents in the report. So for example, we have an appendix on the glossary, we have an appendix on methodology, and then we also have a really comprehensive method uh, appendix on the attorney discipline system itself. So let's just really quickly describe these different uh, legislative codes that are mandated in this report. So the bulk of those tables come from a requirement by the Business and Professions Code and as you can see, it's very clear. We shall issue an ADR report by April 30th. And we're going to report on all of these topics. Okay. And, others, and then there's also these other statutes. Um, and again, this is the list of statutes. And these are the corresponding topics for which the state bar shall report annually every year. So, so when you look at those tables, here's an example. So one statute says, um, says this is subdivision A2 for that particular section of the code. It says the number of inquiries, complaints, and their disposition. This is what the table corresponding to that requirement looks like. And we're required to report not only the current year, but four previous years. So like I said, we're gonna go through the narrative highlights and we're gonna focus on three, I'll focus on three topics and then Melanie will then turn to back a discussion of the backlog of the case prioritization system. So in the narrative I'm gonna to discuss today, um, what we uh, shared about the impact of COVID-19 on the state bar discipline system. We're gonna talk about new and ongoing initiatives and successes, and that's really meant to be just a highlight of, of those different discussions throughout that narrative. And then we're gonna to turn to an analysis that was actually new for the ADR this year, which is to understand long-term discipline trends. So in the first part of the narrative, we talk about elephant in the room. How did the state bar deal with COVID-19? Um, in particular, we talk about the successful transition to remote work for over 500 staff. We also summarize the new procedural changes that allowed electronic service, but all but initial pleadings, the use of electronic services, all sorts of new changes uh, that allowed the state bar discipline system to continue its work. But we also make the case that these changes are actually good for the future. And then finally, uh, we talk about how statewide criminal and civil court closures or near closures statewide and shelter employees, how that led to fewer cases compared to 2019.
We might want to make ask everyone to mute their mics if they're not speaking. We're getting some uh, interference, or at least I am. Okay. Much yeah. better. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Okay. So the next slide in particular speaks to this last point, which is that our, the results show that there were fewer cases opened in 2020 compared to 2019. And that's in table one of the ADR report. However, when you take a step back and look at the overall total cases, in 2020, they're actually 7% higher than they were four years ago. And on the right, we drill down in particular to the types of cases that really have increased since 2017. Those are the new criminal conviction monitoring cases, and they've increased since over 700% since 2017. So largely because of the increase of those types of cases opened, overall, the number of cases that OCTC opened in uh, 2020 is higher than it was four years ago, despite the decrease compared to the previous year. And I have this little star right here uh, to just make the point that when we talk about cases, we're not talking about individual um, attorneys could have multiple cases. And so therefore these 17,000 plus cases really represent around 12,000 attorneys. So next the uh, narrative turns to OCTC and so far we have a discussion about the different social media and traditional outreach that we've conducted that target uh, communities. Uh, we also summarize the research and um, actions and initiatives we've taken regarding addressing all the recommendations addressing racial disparities in the discipline system. Uh, this is work that we've presented to you all several times throughout the course of the year. We also show data that shows that the vast majority of OCTC decisions were upheld by either the complaint review unit and the Supreme Court. And then we also show results that OCTC filed um, notices of disciplinary charges against 180 attorneys representing a 28% increase since 2019. So let's turn now to discipline trends. Um, the results over the last four years shows that the number of attorneys disbarred or suspended continued its downward trend. So um, we've um, instigated a, an analysis to look at, to try to understand this better. And in particular, we analyzed uh, discipline trends over the last 20 years to get a stronger understanding of what is contributing to this downward trend. This chart here is what that chart in the previous slide over, over 20 years. And as you can see, attorney discipline peaked in 2011, and this coincided with the dissipation of the loan modification crisis, which was from 2008 to 2010. And in 2011, nearly 700 attorneys were disciplined and nearly 200 were disbarred. And as you can see, those kind of stayed, especially disbarment stayed a little high over the next several years and then it started a decline. Um, we've uh, conducted a lot of secondary research that found this topic better. And we found that other states that do make their dis attorney discipline data available are also showing the same trends over the last 10 years a downward trend in discipline. And in the report, in the footnotes, we cite to several of those states and their, their, uh, their reporting. And then we also did some additional reading and secondary research about other factors that may be explaining these long-term trends. First, we make the argument that there have been shifts in the legal profession over the last 10 to 20 years. And in particular, there are fewer attorneys that are serving individuals versus businesses. There's also research that shows that there's been an increase in self-representation um, for people in court. So the implication then is that there's fewer opportunities for grievances against attorneys by the general public. And then we also make the argument that there have been shifts in the composition of the California attorney population. In particular, our research shows that the percent of all attorneys who are solo practitioners has declined. And our research with Professor Farkas showed that solo practitioners are particularly at higher risk for discipline. And we also show that the share of female attorneys has increased among all attorneys. And as a group, female, women are at lower risk for receiving a complaint against them and discipline. And that's what the, this next chart shows. Lisa, can I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. 
there's some kind of background noise. I think it might be because your microphone looks like it's a little high. You might consider moving it. I think it's picking up the breath from your nose, maybe. It sounds like banging, but it might be that. How about now? Better. Okay, I yep. just turned off. I just turned off my thumb. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So this chart right here uh, shows um, the percent that of all California attorneys who are solo practitioners over the last twenty years. Those are the blue bars. The red bars are the percent of attorneys who are men. And then the dotted line is the discipline rate per 1,000 attorneys. So let's start with the blue bars. The percent of solo practitioners in two, really peaked in 2006, two years before the start of the loan modification crisis. And then it's been a steady decline since then. Percent of male attorneys uh, peaked in 2001, steady decline since then. And then as you can see, 2011, again, another way of showing the discipline, attorney discipline peak, that year uh, there were, the discipline rate was four attorneys for every 1,000 attorneys in California were disciplined. Okay, so that's all I have for my uh, part of this conversation. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Melanie to take us into a in-depth discussion of the backlog and the case prioritization system. Okay, thanks Lisa, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay, great. So um, the annual discipline report um, does report on backlog and backlog is defined essentially as um, cases that are over 180 days um, and the, the um, measuring date for purposes of the report is December 31st. So how many cases in the inventory are over 180 days after um, or on December 31st? Now, um, when we talk about cases, just to be clear, um, we're not talking about the totality of OCTC's inventory. So primarily what we're talking about is cases that come in to the inventory um, by way of complaining witnesses. Uh, could also be by way of um, bank reports uh, or judges, et cetera. Um, but what it does not include uh, are uh, those cases that come in where there's complaints against non-attorneys, uh, engaging in the unauthorized practice of law. And it also does not include the criminal conviction matters. Um, and those are matters that Lisa alluded to uh, earlier in her presentation. Um, and you saw on the um, charts that um, while the case, the, the complaint rate did decrease in 2020, and when I say complaint rate, I mean primarily those cases that are coming in from complaining witnesses, um, the number of cases that we still have in the inventory related to criminal conviction matters as a result of the state bar's fingerprinting effort um, really remains quite high. That's why you see the 700% increase um, because we still have those cases in our inventory. Um, so in 2018, uh, the office moved to managing sorry, the- Melanie, I'm gonna yes. hold for a second. Um, should we be advancing the slides? No. Uh, no, the no. next slides are all data, so Melanie okay. Let me, right now. Okay, so let me just uh, give give a little primer on case prioritization um, uh, for those of you who, who don't know. Um, so in 2018, uh, the office started looking at the inventory a little bit differently. Um, so when we work cases um, just according to the backlog, um, what that means is we're working the oldest cases first, regardless of um, the public protection risk of newer cases that might be coming in. Um, and so we moved to prioritizing our inventory so that we are first working cases that pose the most significant public protection risk uh, before we are getting to the cases that are a lower um, uh, risk to the public. Um, so that might mean that we have cases that are aging that are lower uh, risk to the public, but those that are newer that are coming in that are higher risk, we're working on those first. And, you know, it really makes sense. I, I wanted to give an example to give some perspective in terms of, you know, what we're talking about in terms of case prioritization. And something that is um, very obvious that comes to mind is thinking about um, how the, the country in particular is dealing with um, COVID-19 vaccines. 
Um, so, you know, the reality is much like, you know, with OCTC, we have finite resources. There are a finite number of uh, vaccines available. So what you do is you give the um, folks who are at the highest risk of COVID-19 vaccines first. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the other folks aren't going to get vaccinated. And of course, that's what we've seen um, in particular in this state. It just means that you have to wait a little bit longer to get your um, vaccine. Um, so the, the other reality, and in thinking about um, COVID-19 vaccines, is that um, even when you set priorities, there are obstacles at times that um, get in your way. So, you know, it, using my example, you know, might have uh, the variants that come up and um, in the COVID-19 and um, the, the questions about whether or not the vaccines you're given, uh, giving are really going to be effective, um, or you have uh, an interruption in the supply. For example, you have the issues that came up um, related to the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. And I say this because while it is true that the um, number of complaints coming into the inventory in 2020 were reduced, and we know that that has to be because of the pandemic, they're just frankly less uh, people engaging with attorneys um, during the pandemic. Um, as I mentioned, we still have the fingerprinting cases, um, and those cases are still very impactful for the inventory, um, and they impact the way that we can move uh, the entirety of our inventory. Um, so we have had some breathing room, um, and we're going to talk about um, what that breathing room has allowed us to do um, over 2020. So if you could um, move us to the next slide. Okay, so um, one thing that we look at um, is our caseload clearance rate. Um, now, what we know is that if we're able to resolve one case for every case that comes in, we're gonna keep our head just right above water. And that's a good thing, 100% 100 caseload clearance rate is the goal. We wanna at least keep our head above water. But what we see is that we've actually done better than that over the last couple of years. So in particular, in the middle bars, you see our highest priority cases. So those are the, P, we call them P1 cases. Um, so for example, a P1 case might be um, a P1 case because the um, victim is a vulnerable victim, maybe an immigrant, maybe uh, a um, incarcerated individual, maybe an elderly person, for example. Um, so what we have seen in focusing on the P1 cases is that the caseload clearance rate in 2020 was actually 146%. Um, and you see that there's been a steady increase in our ability to resolve these cases um, over the last couple of years. Um, also, some, some nice progress that we've seen is in the lower priority cases. So this is the P3 inventory. So this is basically, you know, for the most part, everything else. It's a bit of an oversimplification. But um, what we see is that in 2018 and 2019, we weren't quite keeping our head above water. Um, now, the reality is that um, when you're, when you're, um, prioritizing cases, um, we want to see that highest priority cases that you're more timely about resolving those cases, but it necessarily means that other cases are going to be deprioritized. Um, and that means that the caseload clearance rate, of course, um, is going to be less in the lower priority uh, cases. And it's also going to mean that if you have a backlog, if you have cases that are aging, um, what you want them to be is in those in that lower priority caseload. And that's what we've seen. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But, um, but in the P3 cases, we've actually are also made um, some progress there. And um, Lisa, you're gonna have to tell me what the number is on 2020 because I can't see it because of my thumbnail screen, but I know it's over 100%. Okay, you're on mute. For lowest priority? The lo lower priority yeah, cases. It's, one, yeah. what, it's 113. Okay, perfect. Um, so we are, making, um, we are making progress in the P3 inventory. Um, so that's really positive. Um, can you go ahead and advance it? Okay, and so also really importantly, when we're talking about the backlog number, so in 2019, um, you see that the total backlog number was 2,686, and the um, blue and the red represent what are the higher priority cases and the lower priority cases. So um, you can see that there is a, is a trend down, which is what we're looking for um, in 2020. So not only has the entirety of the backlog decreased, 
um, by 5%, which is a good thing. Um, but more importantly, in the highest priority cases, we are down by 17%. Um, to 429. So we've really made some inroads in uh, to these highest priority cases, which is really, uh, really positive. So can we move on? Okay, so um, here we also see that um, it's another look, another way to look at the highest priority cases and backlog looking at it over time from 2018 to 2020. And you can see the progress that we've made since 2018. Basically, we've reduced that inventory by half, um, the backlogged inventory, which is uh, really significant, especially over just a couple of years. Um, now, here's something important to think about when we're talking about backlog generally, but we're here we're gonna focus on the highest priority cases. Um, so you, you, we can see that we have 429 total uh, P1 cases in backlog. Now, the reality about our inventory, first of all, keep in mind that 429 is number of cases, it's not number of attorneys. So because we know that um, attorneys can have multiple complaints against them. There are actually fewer attorneys represented in this 429. Um, the other thing is um, because we know in many, in many instances that um, there may be cases in the inventory that are going to result in the disbarment of the respondent attorney, um, we actually place the rest of the uh, complaints in what's called a suspended status, meaning essentially we're not gonna work on those cases. But the reality is they still age and they still show up as a backlog case. Um, but it doesn't make sense to concentrate our efforts on those cases when we know that if we concentrate our efforts on just one or a few cases, that alone is going to neutralize the risk to the public. So just to give you an example of how this can really be impactful. Um, so we have, there is one attorney in particular um, who is represented in this graph um, who we have a criminal conviction matter on that is going to result in that attorney's summary disbarment. So it's gonna really actually take us very little resources for the disbarment to occur because it's a summary disbarment. It means we're not actually gonna to have to try the case at all. But this is a person who was part of that loan mod crisis back in you know, 2011, 2012. And so we have a number of complaints um, that have been sitting in the inventory and aging. So they actually are in this, um, this red um, bar here, part of the 220, 69 cases on this one person is in this red bar. And we're, they're, it's, they're just sitting there aging because the reality is that once the criminal conviction is final, which is what we're waiting for, because we still have to wait for the appeals process to go through. And we're almost there this year. I think we're going to see the end. Um, but what will happen is it will move through the process. The Supreme Court will disbar this particular attorney and all of these 69 cases will then be closed. But you know, keep in mind that they've been sitting there for years. So then when you look at the overall numbers and you, and, and you say, how can you have, you know, 69 cases that are, you know, five years old, that's how that happens um, because we're working in other places to resolve the, the inventory. So, but the other thing is in looking at this is when we're talking about attorneys, um, instead of talking about cases, we also are looking at attorneys who are eligible to practice law versus not eligible to practice law. And those that are eligible to practice law obviously are going to present more of a public protection risk than those who are not. Um, so in this graph, you see that of the suspended cases of these 227 cases, um, again, it, in that inventory, there's only 26 attorneys who are actually eligible to practice law. So, um, so really, it actually is making some significant inroads in terms of when you're talking about um, how many actual attorneys are you talking about and how many of those are actually um, potentially uh, a risk to the public because they continue to practice. Okay, You're on mute, just so you know. I was gonna say, let's see what else we have here. Okay, I think that that's all we have for the, uh, your section, Melanie. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Is sure. there anything you wanted to add, Melanie, to close up? Your no, I mean, I just think that overall, what what we can see is that um, you know we have made some steady progress over the years, and you know the pandemic in some ways has given us um, some breathing room. Um, 
But the reality is we don't know what's going to happen as the world opens up. And one might imagine that um, as people become more engaged and perhaps they become more attentive to their legal issues and their hiring attorneys, et cetera, we may see an influx uh, in the number of complaints. Um, and because we're dealing with finite resources, um, we will be challenged then with how we manage um, those complaints. But um, we have been able in the last uh, year to really make a dent in, in the increase, the substantial increase of cases that we saw in 2018 and 2019, largely um, related to the online complaint portal. Um, we've been able to work through a number of those. So we're definitely on the right track. All right. <clears throat> you know, there's some, I apologize, there's some weird background noise. Uh, it's coming from my end when I unmute. Um, so let me throw it open for, uh, let, let's uh, turn off the screen sharing, please. And then uh, throw it out to the trustees for questions or comments. And I'm actually remembering to look for the little raised hands on the screen, but you can also raise your hand like this if you want. Uh, okay, Sonia, were you raising your hand? Yes, I was. I was, Sonia, and I couldn't find my mute button. Thank you so much. I'm just getting... Uh, and, then, and then Brandon, uh, Brandon, after you. Thank you. Uh, Melanie, I'm a little bit confused with the the graph there. Not the graph, but just you mentioned that there, there are only 59 or 69, 57 are responsible for the 420, uh, for the 400 cases. Is that correct and yet and yet in the and yet in in the eligible of the 200 there, there are about 127 attorneys and then 26 are eligible to practice so i'm just getting confused with the number of the number of cases of number of attorneys responsible for all of the 420 400 plus cases and then um and then the person who has the 69 cases is he is he has been suspended for all these years, right? He, or is he is he not practicing. No, no, he's not. He's not eligible to practice law. Okay. He's not eligible to practice law. Um, Lisa, actually, yeah, I thought you were going to put the uh, graph uh, up there. Uh, let me, let me, so uh, I can look at it again. Okay. Yeah. Yes, let's do it. Um, okay. Let me just make sure I have the right one. Oops. Okay. Okay. So what this is showing us, so the total of the highest priority cases in backlog is 429. Um, but when uh, off to the right hand side, um, so 26 attorneys are eligible eligible to practice in the 227 cases which are suspended. So those are the cases that we're just holding on to because the reality is there's probably cases in this blue inventory that we're actually working on um, to actually disbar the attorney. So of the cases that we are working on that are active, they're not being held, um, and that are the highest priority cases and are in backlog, there are 127 attorneys who are eligible to practice. Does that make sense? Sorry, if I could just chime in here, I think- sure. um she was talking about how up here we talk about 57 attorneys. Oh. So picture like in the middle, the, in another red bar that said 57, 57 attorneys are responsible for those 227 cases. Among those 57 attorneys, only 26 are eligible to practice. So this one, that way this, this chart could probably be, be more thorough to put the, show the 57. Only 57 attorneys of the highest priority. Okay. Yes, 57 attorneys are responsible for these 227 uh, highest priority cases that are suspended. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Brandon. All right. Thank you. Um, Melanie, could you put a little bit finer, or, or Lisa, Melanie or Lisa, could you put a little bit finer of a point on when we opened up our web portal complaint process, what year that happened, what happened then with the amount of complaints we saw from that portal plus the, uh, the normal way complaints are submitted? So really we started seeing an increase in the total number of complaints starting in about July of 2018. 
Now, the online complaint portal didn't go up until October 2018. Um, and what we saw with that was really a substantial increase. So even though people were um, filing complaints online, there wasn't a corresponding decrease in the number of complaints that were coming in. And that persisted, and somebody else can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but that persisted uh, into about mid-summer of 2019. Um, so that's really when we saw just really, a. I, I think it, again, somebody can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think it was about a 5% or more increase um, in the total number of complaints. And again, that's we're not talking about the rest of the inventory. So all the fingerprinting cases that we saw, for example, just the complaints that were coming in, mostly from complaining witnesses. So, so you know, what, what you, you know then happens when you suddenly have an influx of complaints um, and, you know, you still have the same resources to deal with those complaints is that a number of them backed up in our intake unit. Um, and what we ended up doing is at the end, well, August, September in particular of 2019, what we did is we took the that inventory that was in intake and we moved it and dispersed it among a number of our um, regular attorneys. Um, Steve and I had had them ourselves um, and we, we all did 10, they're called reads, um, so that we could move that inventory through. And so that was good, we did that. But what, what ends up happening is for the cases that are moving through then, then you see like the, it's like the, um, the snake that ate the elephant. Um, then you, you see that inventory moving, those cases that are moving forward, they're moving into investigations. So then you have late 2019 and then early 2020, you still have people who are then working on that investigation inventory. And so it really takes time to, to sort that entirety of that uh, inventory out. And that's why, I mean, it has been helpful in that we've had lesser complaints coming in in 2020 so that we can move that bulk of the inventory. And then as far as the way uh, COVID has impacted investigations, um, can you just give a brief summation of any uh, you know, negative or positive impact that, that COVID has had on that and just practical challenges that investigations has uh, in dealing with this uh, global pandemic? Sure. I mean, well, I, I guess on the positive side, um, you know, because we launched the Odyssey case management system in 2019, um, it allowed us, our, our folks to work remotely. Um, because we're dealing with electronic files. And so, you know, in many ways, people were able to keep up even though um, they were working from home. However, challenges, um, and, you know, there, there were a number of them, but I'll just name a few. Um, so, for example, our state bar court closed down um, for, you know, I don't six weeks maybe um, or so. And what that meant is that we couldn't actually move cases forward to file because respondents, um, are able to elect to have an early neutral evaluation conference with the court. And because we couldn't get into court, we couldn't move cases out of our filing inventory. In terms of investigations, some of the challenges that came up, um, just for example, we have to give a respondent an opportunity to respond in an investigation in, in writing. Um, so if where you have attorneys who aren't actually physically working in their offices, um, they they often we would often hear from them. I you know I don't I have access to whatever it is the information is. It's in my office. I haven't been in my office. I don't know when I'm going to my office, etc. Um, other challenges is you know we oftentimes uh, subpoena uh, court records uh, and bank records, insurance records, etc. And because a number of courts um, closed or slowed down significantly um, and certainly weren't prioritizing uh, returning court documents by way of subpoena, um, we had to wait significantly for documents um, true of banks as well. Um, you know, also just with complaining witnesses um, who were around, um, they didn't necessarily have access to um, the information that we needed because they might have been physically located somewhere else. So those, a bunch of practical uh, implications like that came up. Great, thank you. Sure. All right, um, further discussion, Mark Tony. Oh, Mark, you're muted. 
Thank you. There you go. Um, I have a few questions. I, I first want to say that I, I thought this was a impressive results reflected in this report. And um, I, I actually think it looks very, uh, it looks very good. I do have some uh, questions about some of the uh, charts that were ambiguous and some maybe ideas on, on what to do about it. Um, the first one is on page four, table one, cases opened by OCTC. And uh, um, what's very unusual to me is that the, um, you've got four years listed, but the percent change compares 2020 with 2017. And I wonder if that's a statutorial requirement that the legislature um, has put in, uh, assuming that that's the first full year of the uh, switchover from the integrated bar to the regulatory bar, maybe, I don't know. But um, I, I generally, when people put percentage changes, they usually compare the last two years. So that was my first question. That, that's a very, and it's the only place you do it. You actually have a number of other places where you have year to year comparison and, you, and the percentages are actually from 2019 to 2020. This was an outlier. I was just trying to figure that out. I'd like to actually take that if I may, since I uh, yeah. was, sitting in on the meeting and i believe i'm the one who made the recommendation that we highlight that okay. and it was a simple it was a simple discussion of um looking at the decline in the last year um where we would, office of chief trial counsel was working uh remotely and um the number of cases had fallen as a result of many of the things that have been discussed and we just wanted to note that although it's a decline in the cases from year to year over the previous um it's not it's not like we are sitting on our hands or like there isn't work to be done. And I just wanted to highlight the fact that for those four years of data that we're required to present, if you look back, you only have to go back two years and you can still see that we're, we're above where we've been in the past. Okay. I, w w what I think is that um, it's understandable that COVID caused uh, disruption in everybody's work, um, not just the bars. And I think it's okay to put an asterisk and just remind people. But I, I, I think if you're gonna put percentages, uh, my feeling is that 19 to 20, to be consistent with the rest of the charts that are in the same report, um, you know, I, I, I kind of like consistency myself. Um, that, you know, you, know, you know, kind of thematic consistency throughout a single report. Maybe other people don't, you know, won't care, but I'm going to keep going. These are, you know, these are recommendations. I'm not, you know, I'm not voting a, a problem on these. These are questions and comments. So I'm going to go on. The second one that I highlighted was on page, um, well, page eight, figure three on page eight. That's just an example where you've got all four years and you're comparing 2019 to 2020. So that, that that's an example of what I'm saying. When when you know when you highlight plus 28 percent, that's the, from the year before. So anyway, let's go on to page um, 11. Um, I I I just want to point out this is an outstanding graph, an outstanding information. Of, of showing that in 2020, there was progress made on both the highest priority cases and the lower priority cases. That's really terrific. And I, I, I think that's gonna speak very well of, you know, particularly in a COVID year that that was done. I, in some ways, to me, this is the highlight of the whole report. Uh, that's just my opinion. I might even consider putting it closer in the front or highlighting it in another way. It's, to me, that's where um, I am incredibly impressed. Um, and then uh, page 15, figure seven. This is one we've had up a, a, um, a, a little while. 
the information describing the figure and the chart don't quite all match up. We've got the 429 priority cases. That's good. It's we see 429 when you add the 202 and the 227 and it's listed. I'm having a hard time figuring out where the 57 are. I, I, I just, I can't do the math. I can't, I can't subtract or add anything and get to 57 from the four pieces of information, the two blues and the two reds. I just can't find the 57. So it'd be good to, it's just useful for, you know, the 26 is there. I find the 26, which is the next number. I just like it when the numbers in a description of a bar chart are reflected in the bar chart. Look, I'm just saying, this is what I'm thinking other people are gonna look at, you know, in the legislature, staff people who have lots of time and really wanna dig in because, you know, they, they got something to, to show. Um, but, but, you know, just th that would be useful. And the other thing is, or can I, Oh, please. Mind, I just want to, because this is such a detailed point, I think it's a very good point. I just want to make a suggestion to implement your idea, which mm -hmm. would be, um, or to address your, your comment, which is, I think in, in the, 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 the bar on the left, which has 429 at the top, if you just, uh, put, for example, in the blue thing, 202 cases and X attorneys. So it would be clear right there, something like that. I think that's what Mark is looking for, but he can tell me if I'm yes, right. Yes, something like that. It's just, yeah. it's just, it's just good. That's, that's, look, you know, that these are my suggestions. And then I had one other general question, which was on, in one of the appendices, um, it's called SR32 is the name of the page. It's called Condition of the Client Security Fund. And I read through it and I, here's, so, you know, I think this is reimbursing clients who, whose money disappeared in a attorney account. That's what I think this means. And there's a whole listing of it. And it says 265 attorneys, 832 claims paid, 11 million and change paid. And I guess my question with this is, um, do, you know, what happens to these, I assume this money is paid off before it's collected from the attorneys. I'm just presuming that you don't wait till you get the money back but you got to collect from them afterwards. I'm just curious what happens with, with all this and with these attorneys who owe this money? So I'll, I'll, I'll certainly be happy to take that. Um, uh, and this actually goes back to other discussions we've had uh, at the last boarding and board meeting and one we've got coming up at the, uh, at the other board meeting. Um, attorneys, as part of their licensing fees, uh, con all contribute, um, if they're active, active attorneys, they contribute $40 of their licensing fee um, to support the client security fund. It's an obligation that all attorneys have. Obviously, only a small number of attorneys ultimately are um, uh, committing the kind of misconduct that would lead to a payout from the client security fund, but it is considered an obligation of all attorneys to support the profession that way. <clears throat> um, and so, yes, Mark, we certainly, um, the process is that um, an attorney who uh, is determined by the client security fund to have uh, caused the um, uh, misappropriation of client, uh, client money, the loss of client money due to their misconduct, the client security fund reimburses them from that pool of money that we get from license fees. And then we engage in subsequently engage in collection efforts um, from the attorney um, to collect those monies. Um, and so that's how that process works. And we'll actually be talking a little bit more about that at, um, at the upcoming board meeting. Thank you very much. You bet. Thanks, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, further discussion, comments? Questions? Jose. 
Thanks, Sean. I'll join everybody else in terms of uh, thanking the staff and uh, commenting on how um, I think thorough and um, explanatory this report is. I think it's a it's a good product, and I think it'll give everybody a lot of great idea and insight into what's going on at the bar. Um, and with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve the report with uh, maybe some of the um, suggestions and improvements that have been discussed here. Thank you, Jose. Do I hear a second? This is Brandon, I'll second. Thank you. Uh, Brandon, you have your hand up. Did you have more commentary? I, I did want to once the motion was made. Very good, please do. So I, in, in addition to what Mark uh, said, I really want to congratulate um, staff on the incredible work uh, that you have really had to do in this past year and a half. Um, I don't think anybody quite knows the long lasting effects of the pandemic, but what I do know is that state bar staff, uh, members of state bar court, um, probation, everybody really at the state bar has pulled together in a way that I think is impressive and monumental and really speaks to your dedication to protecting the public. Um, you know, as Melanie said, there um, there's still many courts that aren't fully open um, or open at all. And, uh, you know, really thanks to the, uh, just the flexibility initiative and uh, dedication of, of employees, we've been able to continue to protect the public in a very trying time. And these numbers really speak to that. Uh, you know, 146 cases, um, Close for every 100 that were submitted at the highest priority. I think it's like Mark said, is one of the absolute um, gold stars that you can really take from this. Uh, plus, reducing the priority uh, one caseload um, is um, cut, cutting it in half in two years. That's on page uh, 12. It really uh, stood out to me. And the thing that I don't know if we talk about enough, but I always, I always love to highlight it is the client security fund and the efforts that attorneys uh, make in order to right the wrongs of, of bad actors in our profession should not and cannot be understated. And in 2020, um, claims were paid out regarding the misconduct of 832 lawyers. We paid out $11.75 million uh, for those claims. This is an increase from 2019, where we paid out $6.92 million and just, again, this, this goes to attorneys trying to right the wrongs of those in the profession. And I think that uh, is commendable. I want to congratulate the staff of the Client Security Fund in making victims whole or trying to put them back in uh, the position they were before that misconduct occurred. So Melanie, Steve, Lisa, Dag, everybody who was involved, thank you for putting this together. And uh, just, uh, just want to commend the staff because you guys are the ones who are uh, filling those pressures on a daily basis to get your work done, to um, have that home life work balance now that the office is now in your home. And so I uh, thank you to each uh, employee at the State Bar who uh, juggles those, those stresses on a daily basis. All right. Anything more from board members? All right. Before we take a vote, I will, uh, I just join in the praise for staff who poured a lot of work into this report. Amassing all the data in the back portion of this document is a tremendous amount of work. And I know a lot of care goes into uh, making sure that it's as accurate as it possibly can be. And as I told Donna privately, I thought the narrative section and the charts and so on were just fantastic, very user friendly very easy to understand, even if you don't have a background in the area at all. And so it's really a, a very fine piece of work. Um, and uh, I've sent some minor comments to Donna too. They're not worth discussing in the board meeting. Um, now, um, Lisa, would you mind putting the res or gag, whoever put the resolution up again? I do have a suggestion for the mover and the second of this motion to consider, which is non-substantive edits is pretty restrictive. Um, I mean, obviously there's not gonna be huge monumental changes, but some of the edits I sent to Donna said to be substantive and that they change words or something. So how about instead of non-substantive, something like clarifying and correcting edits? Uh, 
this is okay. This is Jose. I'm okay with that. This is Brandon. I'm okay with that. Okay. Thank you. So, um, unless anyone else wants to be recognized, and I don't see any sign of that, um, let's go ahead and take the roll on the on the motion as amended. Terrific. I had a motion from Cisneros, seconded by Stallings. Broughton. Yes. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. Delenn. Yes. Duran. Thank you to staff and yes. Thank you. Ganong? Yes. Sewell? Yes. Stallings? Yes. Tony? Aye. Seleg? Uh, excuse me, no Seleg. The chair only votes in the case of a tie. I will learn that, I'm sure, before the pandemic is over, maybe. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think this was a marvelous discussion. Um, you know, as we know, in recent years, as part of the separation of the former uh, associational aspects of the state bar with regulatory, you know, this is part of our core mission uh, is, is looking at the discipline system, how it's operating, how it's moving cases, which cases are being prioritized. And so uh, I'm really, was really glad to hear this very healthy and robust uh, discussion today. Chair Sulek, may I interrupt to note that I see uh, Trustee Sowell has a hand raised. I did, yes, please, Arnie, go ahead. Just real, real quickly, I'm, I'm just very interested in sort of the logistics of this in terms of uh, how it gets transmitted and, you know, um, folks can start talking about this as of when, or folks can start communicating with people as of when about this. About the report? Yes. Uh, well, it's the draft is public, the meeting is public, so you uh, yes. you're free to talk to anyone you want to about it. In my okay. way, unless Donna or someone else will correct me on that. Uh, no, that that's fine, and our um, our goal um, is to be able to turn it around so we can transmit it to the legislature on April the twenty seventh. Uh, we will uh, we are developing a short, you know, two page um, fact sheet um, that can go along with it. It's a long report. We'll be sure to um, send that fact sheet out to the board members, um, so you've got that as well um, for um, uh, commu any communications that, that you engage in. Great, thank you. Okay, anything else? <coughs> All right. Um, before we adjourn, I just want to um, address the members of the Chief Trial Council Search Committee. We will continue with our closed session at two fifteen as scheduled. So 215, return to the closed link for Chief Trial Counsel search. Thanks everyone. Thanks all.